Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, well, I'm not really a morning person, but um, so I'm still waking up. But I'm here, and so are you. Thank you for all for coming. And thank you, Creative Mornings, for inviting me. Um, I had to talk about equality, so I went to look at Google and uh, read a lot of articles and stuff like that. But then it went all really deep, and then I thought, okay, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just keep it to myself, to the work I do in the LGBT scene. Um, LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual and transgender. And you got many more letters like, wait, I'm going to do it like this. I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest. It has been like a thousand years ago that I did a presentation, so I'm sorry for that. If uh, anybody has any questions, just interrupt me and uh, ask me anything. Um, but uh, you have many more letters like Q for queers, uh, I for intersexual, and there are only more adding to it. But I like to call it LGBT plus, and um, I like to talk about when I grow up. I'm a farmer boy. Um, I was born and raised in the south and in the north on a farm. Uh, my parents were very um, conservative, very Catholic, uh, very strict, old-fashioned. So, um, and that's everything I'm not anymore, thank God. And uh, yeah, as a young kid, I was I was always working on the farm. I was milking cows. Oh wait, I have also made some cheese. This was my best friend when I was young, a sheep. I also had a cow and a horse and all, they were all my best friends. Um, and I was also driving trucks and uh, doing farm stuff. And then my parents expect me a little bit to take over the farm. So I would be still a farm man now. But thank God that didn't happen because probably I would kill myself. Um, so I uh, also found out when I was around 17, 18, that I was gay, that I like boys and not girls. And if you're on a farm, then the only, there are no gay people there. So um, when I saw gay people, you know, on TV and there were all this extravaganza, flamboyant people, and the media, I hate the media for that, they always put very much stereotypes, very much cliches, you know, it's always the, uh, in the pink strings and the boas and like all the gay people singing I Will Survive all day. Well, when I was 17, 18, it was a little bit too much to take that, you know, and now I'm doing it, everything of that. <laughs> Still not singing I Will Survive all day, but I'm, I'm embrace everything that's gay. I love everything that's gay. But um, when I was young, I was a little bit like, okay, you know, you go through that phase of accepting yourself. Like, okay, I like boys, I'm different. And if you're on a farm, you have nobody around you, you know? So that was a bit weird. So I s escaped to the city. I went to study. I went to Breda. <clears throat> I didn't know anybody over there. That was amazing. And I thought, I'm going to start a whole new life. Uh, and then I stu uh, studied media and entertainment management. I had no clue. The whole study was in English. My English was horrible. It was the first time I saw a laptop in real life. Um, <laughs> I felt like an alien because all those students with me were talking English. I, I really had no clue what was going on. But I stayed. I survived. I didn't finish that study, of course. But um, it, was, it was a good time. I, I learned a lot. And uh, then I moved to Amsterdam and I was looking for a uh, work placement. And I uh, started a work placement at Paradiso, at the PR marketing department. And there I got a lot of, uh, uh, how do you promote events, concerts, stuff like that, that was really interesting. But also the whole uh, brand image, like Paradiso, how can we make it bigger? How more people get to know Paradiso as a brand? Um, so that was the first time I did something in my life that I liked. And that was a, a good start. Then uh, I stayed there for one and a half years because I quit my study. Well, kind of. Um, I stayed for the, the study financiering. I don't know the English word, you know, to get the, the money from the study, but never go to school. Um, I thought it was a good investment. Um, and then I said to Paradiso, like, do a club night at Sunday. Sundays are really boring in Amsterdam. So then the next day they offered me a job and I became a booker and a promoter at Paradiso. And I had to put a weekly Sunday club night. And Paradiso is quite big. 
So for me, I, I didn't even celebrate my own birthday. So at an event, I have no fucking clue <laughs> how to do that. So I was just sitting there and I was like, yeah, I can do some PR marketing stuff. But and then we were like, no, you have to make that whole thing happen. And thank God for Paradiso that they trusted me and that they saw something in me. And uh, they were really a platform for me. So I could cr develop myself and I started to make concepts for them. Um, and, you know, concepts are wait. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> and then, yeah, concepts, all kind of concepts. My concepts were always very open-minded. And, well, one day I woke up and I felt like paranoid. And then I was like, hey, para, diso, paranoid. Let's call it paranoia, and um, it's always different how you come up with concepts, and because the other one is too many dicks on the dance floor, which I still love that name, <laughs> I was just watching a series, and they were singing a song called Too Many Dicks on the Dance Floor, and I was like, that's an amazing name for a party. <laughs> and then from there, you start the whole process like, okay, what are we going to do? I love to play with gender, so as you can see, are those girls? Are those boys? No, it's just one big gender mix. And that's also the crowd I always like to come to events that I organize. Um, if it's very gay with only men, then, uh, well, there are a lot of parties like that. But it's not really my thing. I like it when it's gay, straight, everything in between, girls, boys. I always like it if it's very open-minded so people know, you know, if you see this this flyer and you are straight and you don't like gays then you're not like oh this is my party here i want to go <laughs> not at all so with artwork with um stuff like that you can make really clear what kind of party you're organizing i think i think i'm skipping a lot of things i want to say but so then um after a couple of years of organizing stuff uh, doing uh, productions doing PR marketing concepts at Paradiso. It was uh, with a, a girl who was working for Club Air and I was working at Paradiso. We were sitting on a Monday at my kitchen table and we were just like, okay, we want so to do something new, something that's not there yet and let's go a little big st uh, s uh, step bigger. Um, <clears throat> so we want to do a festival and it should be something that's very open-minded. We didn't want to call it a gay festival. Uh, we didn't, didn't want the label. We don't like to put things in boxes. I hate that when people put stuff in a box. It's always so nice to put a stamp, you're gay, you're straight, you're whatever, bye. And it's, it's really easy to do that. So we um, made that night at my kitchen table a whole concept. And then we created this name with it called uh, Milkshake Festival. And the next day we went to our bosses and we said, okay, we have an ID, you guys have the money. If you invest in us, we're gonna make it happen. But we had no fucking clue what we were doing because we never organized a festival before. But then it was like, okay, do it, let's go for it. And <clears throat> in that process, it was, I think sometimes you have that, the right people, the right time, the right instruments, you know? I called Erwin Olaf, a, a photographer, and I said, okay, you are the perfect guy. You got this vision that's very open-minded, that's very, you know, doesn't matter who or what you are. And uh, we would love to shoot you the artwork of Milkshake Festival. And he did. And I think that came out pretty well. That's this one, maybe you remember it. Um, we never said it's, it's a gay festival, um, but we had like a slogan for boys who love girls, who love girls, who love boys, who love boys. So that's like everyone. Um, and, you know, you have a guy in a leopard speedo and a girl, not that, not that skinny, but a beautiful body. And um, the guy wears lipstick, you know, it, it are things to don't say it. It's a gay or a LGBT festival, but it's how you bring it with artwork, with media partners. Well, this one is very clear. Where is it? Oh, it's not on here, but one of our media partners was gay.nl. But, um, <laughs> but it, it is the way with, with media partners you work with, uh, with artwork you show, but also um, because back in the days when I was starting with organizing parties, I was this stupid kid that was always with a backpack on, you know? 
just going out seven days a week with a backpack full of flyers, full of posters, and be everybody like, hi, come to my party, come to my party, come to my party. And they were like, oh, fuck off, we will come to your party in the end. But you get annoying because you didn't have like really social media. You got hives, but people didn't use hives that much for uh, promoting events. These days you got social media, you know, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and it's all, it's perfect to promote your events. But then, um, yeah, it, 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 then it was different. So you were just, when you had an article in a newspaper, then you were the biggest party uh, of that week and you would be like sold out anyway. But um, these days it's a little bit more easy to promote your uh, events. So via social media, of course, every organization has their own Facebook page and stuff like that. But also there, it's so important how you um, uh, show yourself and that can also, you don't have to say uh, very specific, this is a gay thing or this is a straight thing. It's just, it, it's interesting the, the, to find the middle line, I think. Um, let me see. Oh, and then I had an after move, but we're going to skip that. And then I started a new challenge and that was uh, Club Nix. That's a club, an open-minded club at the uh, Regri Dwarstraat. Um, they asked me to uh, start there as creative director and PR manager. In the end, I had like 10 uh, jobs, I think, the, over there because we uh, started in a really small crew. So I did all the concepts, the production, the PR marketing, the website, the artwork. Uh, the, well, what didn't I do? I did everything over there. Um, but I, I learned a lot and it was really interesting. We didn't have much money when we started because of all the, the building stuff and everything. We uh, had some problems. So for PR marketing, I had like maybe 5,000 euro in the first year. So you had to come up with anything and uh, to have a lot of free publicity. So then you start to use your network. So, oh, you know, somebody at the newspaper. Oh, you know, a photographer. Oh, you know, you know, you're gonna, I needed all the free publicity, which was uh, pretty hard, but it was um, interesting. We had a, like an open door policy. Everybody was welcome, but, um, and there comes equality. Um, respect each other, respect gays, lesbians, straight, you know, um, we want to be kind of an LGBT club, but everybody was welcome. Please bring your friends and feel welcome. And if you had problems with that, then fuck off and never come back. Um, but we were really friendly for the rest. And um, <laughs> what did we do? Uh, ta -ta yeah. Is this, yes, oh, this is also working. Um, and then I like to make a move to this Amanda Lapore. We booked her, she's from America, she's strange and beautiful, everything at the same time. Uh, one of the concepts I did was the House of Knicks. Um, does anybody know RuPaul Drag Race over here? <laughs> Four people, yes. <laughs> uh, well, RuPaul Drag Race is like uh, America's Next Top Model with drags. We all know what drag queens are, yeah? A man in a dress with a wig looking beautiful. Um, so, uh, RuPaul Drag Race, all those drag became like rock stars, uh, which is really interesting. So, I was the first one in 2013, I guess, who brought them over to Amsterdam. And that was really interesting what happened then, um, because I had no clue, you know, the, 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 the TV program was popular here, but they didn't broadcast, so everybody was downloading it and watching it on the internet. And then I brought the first one over from America and it was sold out. Every edition I did with a famous drag from America was selling out and people were like, it was like Beyonce came in, you know? <laughs> they were like living it for it. It was crazy. It was like going to a, a gay church or something. Then, and I, I always try to, to take care of those artists that I booked, you know? Uh, we didn't have much money, so I was picking them up from the airport like bringing to my house, cooking for them, and then uh, bring them to the sound check. And just, you know, that they feel comfortable. That's really important because in the end, when we arrived at the club, I had to say, oh, this is your stage. It's one by one. Good luck. 
um, which was really annoying. But the first time we brought this drag, her name was Sharon Needles, that was pretty amazing. It, it was, I never saw that in, in that club yet. Um, she was coming in, people were just like screaming, like, like crazy people, you know? Screaming for like, like they see Beyonce, like I would scream if I would see Beyonce. <laughs> and it was just really weird. It was like a drag church or something. Um, very interesting, and, um, and it was just a risk, you know, because maybe nobody cared that she was coming. So it was a success, so we did that. We brought it to also a, a festival, to uh, the House of Nick stage. So we hosted a couple of festivals with the House of Nick stage, which was also really nice. I will show you in a bit. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. Few? Okay, we skip this one. This was the Rainbow Awards I did. It's an award show to bring some positivity in the LGBT scene. Uh, we did it in Tushinsky, a beautiful theater, and we gave awards away for like best club, best um, singer, best musical. Next. Um, so then we have Super Bowl, and um, it's also a drag show. Uh, I do it with three friends. We organize every year in Paradiso because I think drag is a beautiful form of entertainment and art, and a lot of people still see it as, uh, oh, that's a gay thing. You know, if you go to like New York every Sunday at the Hard Rock Cafe, uh, families, tourists, it doesn't matter who, what, whatever, they're sitting there eating their burger and watching a drag show because they see it as a form of entertainment. Here, it's still very much a gay thing, and, um, and it's a beautiful uh, uh, form of art. So. Every year in Paradiso, we have like more than 100, 120 drags who are battling against each other on stage. And that's very hysterical, I can tell you, in all different kind of categories. Um, uh, we also hosting uh, uh, a few stages. And there I will show you a small example. Oh yeah, click. Work me, God damn it. It, it, you should have you should have been there next time come <laughs> so another thing I like to talk about um, as a freelancer I work for the pride organization and well tomorrow happy pride already everybody tomorrow pride 2017 starts here in Amsterdam it's for nine days and last year they um, hired me as freelancer to organize all the main events uh, from Euro pride every year one country gets the title Euro pride and then your uh, bigger pride and then more people are coming, more tourists, more people at, uh, will come to the events. So we had for the first time since the 70s a festival at the Vondel Park, which is a monument. And um, I had to organize it. It was really nice, but it was a hell of a job to organize it because you have police, the fire department, the government. and. Everybody had to say something about it, um, which uh, and also the same at the Dam Square. We did a huge party on Saturday night and a really big um, a human rights concert with more than 120 musicians and we broadcast it uh, on TV. And also uh, they were not used to it, to do such a big events on the Dam Square. So um, there were a lot of pain in the asses uh, of people 
who were like, oh, and this is not possible, and this is not possible, and you have like a thousand of rules. Um, so I will not talk about that. Um, <laughs> Oh, and then there was Conchita Wurst, of course. We, we all know her of uh, Eurovision, I guess. Rise like a phoenix. She was the ambassador of last year. And it was interesting to work with her because she's always this, I'm the, the man with the beard or the woman with the beard and in a dress or something. And we did a photo shoot with her. So, um, and we were not sure what we were doing that day, but I wanted to play with gender because she is gender, you know? She is... Huh? Is he a man? Is he a woman? Is he a woman who doesn't take care of the beard, you know, cut it away? Um, so we, pl we played that day at the photo shoot. So this is just, for a lot of people, this is a fucked up image, which I love. I love to shock people a little bit, and this is not really a shocking picture, but it's nice to play with gender. Um, then, well, another thing I organized at the Pride is Pride Walk. 15,000 people walking from the Fondo Park to the Dam Square. Uh, this is not a bomb explosion, thank God. This is firework at the Dam Square. Um, oh wait, let's go back one more. Yeah. Um, one of the nice things of the Pride, um, because yeah, people always think, oh yeah, everybody's on the boats, so all the big parties, the street parties. But what I um, uh, found out when I was working at an organization, um, you have all something in common, common sorry, um, because you have all this phase of coming out that you found out that you're different, that you are gay or transgender or a lesbian or whatever. And we had a lot during the whole year when you're sitting at the office, we got a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls of people who were just asking for help. And that could be someone who found out that he was different, that he was gay, or someone who was living in a country where you still can get murdered for that, uh, or can get in jail because you are gay. Um, but also, like, I, I remember that one day the, the phone uh, rang and I picked up, hello, uh, Amsterdam Pride with Peter. And then this guy started, yeah, I like to come out. And I was like, oh, that's good for you. Perfect, you should do that. Um, but then he was like, yeah, I'm already out, but I like to come out um, as a pedophile. And then I was like, okay, well, that's a different story. But so it, it's so many different people with a lot of problems of coming out, of accepting themselves and to love themselves, you know? It's a whole phase. And, um, well, this person, I couldn't help myself, or I couldn't help him personally, but um, uh, I sent him, you know, uh, for him an organization who could help him. So, working for the Pride was much more than only organizing big events. It was really a community thing, and that's, uh, that touched me. And um, that's why I liked it the most. Um, that I already explained. Oh yeah, and then there's one more thing I do. That's me at the left. Um, I'm a DJ as well uh, at the DJ duo, the G Team, uh, with one, one of my best friends, Thijs, and we do that since seven years. And we just started as a joke, you know, because it was crisis uh, when I was organizing parties, so I didn't have that much money to book DJs. So I thought, hey, I'm gonna start just the first two hours myself. People are just walking in. So I just started play at the end of the song, did stop, put my hands in the air and said, okay, people, are you ready for the next song? And play. <laughs> and that's how we started. And that was working fine for a while. And, um, but then people start to ask us also from, hey, that was fun. Well, fucking crazy, but that was fun. Can you play at my party? I mean, sure, put some beers. You know, we were always drunk when we were playing. And then uh, they also started to, to give us money and we were like, interesting, interesting. <laughs> so after doing that for two years, just being drunk as fuck, um, we were like, okay, let's, let's make this a little bit more serious. And we are doing fine, I think. We are playing mostly in uh, gay, open-minded parties. And the problem, I, I love it, I love it. As I said, I love everything that's gay. Um, the problem with all those open-minded parties is when you like techno, for example, 
and you see this great techno DJ, you go to that techno party and all of those people go because they love techno. With um, LGBT scene, it's like people come together for the community. They come because you're equal, you're all gay, lesbian, transgender, whatever, or the, the straight girls love to be around uh, the gay guys and not by irritated straight guys who are flirting with them. Um, I know some girls. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and that's the thing, so when you are playing, we play pop, disco, house music, whatever, but uh, you're not gonna make everybody happy. You know, I have a lot of times really annoying faces just at the front of the DJ booth and then it's like, can you play dubstep? <laughs> can you play hardcore? And stuff like that. I'm like, no, I'm playing disco house music. So it's always a little bit difficult to please everybody. But um, it's a lot of fun. We just uh, did um, uh, Madrid, London and Norway, all Prides. And uh, tomorrow Pride starts, so I have a really busy schedule this coming week. Um, um, I think that's it. I just want to uh, tell you my motto, and I think that has everything to do with equality, and that's treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, I think that's where it all starts. You like, I like to be nice to you guys. You guys should be nice to each other, and in that way we all are working on a better world, I think. Um, well, I think this was my presentation. I hope you liked it. And if there are any questions, please uh, ask.